Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Have Pakistan's elections made the crisis in the country worse? That's one of the key issues that I should explore today with one of Pakistan's foremost journalists, the founder and editor of the Friday Times, and the former caretaker chief minister of Pakistan's Punjab province, Najam Sethi. However, Mr. Sethi, I'm going to begin a little differently. The Election Commission of Pakistan results show that Nawaz Sharif's PMLN party is the single biggest, although independents as a whole have far more seats. But the question is, is that the real result? Do you, for instance, believe it? Most people don't believe it. The international community thinks that there's been some hanky-panky, and the Imran Khan's party thinks there's been a lot of hanky-panky, and independent observers think it wasn't the fairest selection in recent times. So having answered that question, let's move on a little bit. The thing is that this election has yielded a majority for Imran Khan's candidates. The government's position is that if it had been rigged, that wouldn't have happened. Imran Khan has swept one province, which is the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. And his independents number more than either the People's Party's uh, uh, candidates or the uh, Nawaz League's candidates. So yes, I think on the whole, uh, the PTI has got what it wanted. Their complaint is that there was some select rigging on election day. Prior to the election, there were a lot of obstacles placed uh, in, in the path of the PTI, which is Imran Khan's party. There's no doubt about that. We can list them, but I don't think we need to go over them. So there's some truth in this, that if it had been an absolutely free and fair election, which by the way, had hardly ever happened in Pakistan, uh, uh, the PTI would have got more seats, maybe even had a majority. As it is, that hasn't happened. No party has got a majority. The independents who claim to belong to the PTI um, are about 10 or 15 seats more than uh, the uh, PPP. So we have to wait and see now which way the wind blows. Let me put some of the concerns that have been expressed about the alleged rigging before I come to other deeper issues. Al Jazeera reported that on Thursday night, Pakistan went to bed with Imran Khan's candidates standing as independents in the lead, but woke up on Friday morning to find that PMLN candidates had snatched the lead. Al Jazeera was reporting this as a clear case of rigging. Would you accept that? You know, I was up till one o'clock at night. Uh, by that time, only 10 to 15 percent of the votes had come in. The rest came in during the night and the following day. Um, at that time, there were air, there were seats where the PTI was leading uh, by 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 votes. Uh, and some of those were overturned by the time the 100% results came in. So the perception at that time was uh, that first, that all the election results should have come in by 12.30. Why didn't they come in? That's where the suspicions begin. Because all of a sudden, around 12.30 or so, uh, the results start, stopped coming from the election commission. And it turned out that there was some hitch in conveying the results from the polling stations to the election commission. And most people think that was done deliberately in order to find space 
in which to fix certain seats. Now, Asad Beg, reporting for Al Jazeera from Lahore, and I should point out to the audience that you are also speaking to us from Lahore, has cited instances where the winning candidate from the PMLN won more votes than were actually cast in that constituency. He also says that in several instances, candidates' representatives were not allowed to be present during the counting. If all of that is true, isn't it surely both wrong and, more importantly, illegal? This, these things have happened in all our elections, where this, these irregularities or crookedness has erupted in certain constituencies. So I'm not surprised in the least if there are some reports of such things happening. Social media in your country is, and I'm using this verb deliberately, flooded with allegations of ringing voices of people who've been denied majorities. In one instance, a person said she had a lead of 50,000. When she went to bed the next morning, she had lost. Given the question marks surrounding the outcome, will the people of Pakistan, who it seems have turned out in a fairly sizable way to vote 48%, accept this result. It's widely believed that they've stood up and defied the establishment who didn't want the independence to be the single largest and wanted MP, PMLN to win. Now, having defied the establishment, will they accept being thwarted? It's true. They will defy the establishment in a very forceful manner. There's no doubt about that, which is why so many of PTI candidates have won. If they hadn't defied the establishment by staying at home or being afraid to come and vote according to their conscience, then this wouldn't have happened. So they have defied the establishment. And I think it surprised the establishment also that they've defied it in such a manner. The establishment did everything it could to thwart a bigger turnout, uh, you know, picking up people, arresting them, uh, initiating uh, cases against them and so on. And also intimidating them in many in, in different ways, uh, the PTI candidates. There's no doubt about that. But you know, at the end of the day, we are a bit cynical uh, because we've seen a lot of this happening in early elections too. So I think the surprising thing for all of us is that the Noon League, Nawaz League, didn't get as many votes as the pollsters said they might, and Imran Khan's people romped home, uh, which is to say that therefore uh, this is a as fair as an election you could have imagined with the establishment on one side and all the others on the other side. So there have been queries from the international community and others. But you know, the history of Pakistan is that at the end of the day, when an election takes place, it's hardly ever recalled or hardly ever canceled. And that stamp of illegitimacy, in a sense, hangs over the head of every government. In 2018, much the same sort of thing happened when, when the Nawaz League was thwarted by so many ways and the system broke down to fix the number of seats for Imran. And then Imran was always referred to as a selected prime minister. My sense is that that stigma will, will haunt this next regime as well. But I it's not going to make a difference. This is as fair an election as Pakistan could have expected, but I noticed that this morning the Lahore High Court has already stayed one result which went in favor of PMLN and Al Jazeera reports that a hundred more PTI independent candidates are knocking on the judiciary's doors. Could it turn out that many more results which have gone in favor of PMLN will in fact be stayed? Well, you know, it's the Lahore High Court can stop somebody's, um, the announcement of that A, B or C has won. But it cannot overturn that result. That only the election tri tribunals can do, which have been set up by the election commission. So many of these petitions will be referred back to um, some of them, the candidates who have lost, uh, they may be stayed, meaning that there's no result a pending an investigation or an audit by election tribunals. The high courts are not in a position to audit ballot boxes and so on and so forth. They can simply say, stop this result, go back to the election tribunal, pull out the ballot boxes and all the other forms and let them do a forensic audit and decide who, who has won and who has lost. But given that many of the results could end up in court, could end up in election tribunals, maybe also given the fact that the result is not what the establishment wanted, will this result as a whole 
embarrass Army Chief General Munir and the establishment? Will it upset them? I don't think they'll be there very happy at the result. But are they upset? Will it uh, haunt them? Will it thwart their plans? I don't think so. They're used to this sort of thing. They've been bad mouthed all across the country and they're carrying on. The result has happened at a time when Pakistan faces the worst economic crisis in its 77 year history. You face a political crisis as well. In the light of everything we've discussed, have these elections made the country's crisis worse? Can it halt Pakistan's downward spiral or is that unlikely? The general idea is that if you had a stable government with a big majority, uh, it would have a clear run to do the sort of things that need to be done. But, you know, in the last 18 or 19 months, this establishment has demonstrated that an alliance of the PPP and the Noon League, the Nawaz League, uh, in terms of a coalition government, can be egged on to follow the IMF agenda, which is tough. And they have the military establishment has already during this period established certain mechanisms to make sure that the parts that they have chosen to put the economy back on track is not derailed. And I think that message has gone out loud and clear to both Mr. Asif Sardari, Mr. Bilawal Bhutto on the one side and Mr. Nawaz Sharif and Shabazz Sharif on the other side. I think they will be told to get on and do the things that need to be done. And I think both parties owe them for more than a little bit for being returned to power. So to sum up this section of the interview, have I understood correctly if I were to say that you're telling me that although the results have been a surprise for the establishment and maybe even will upset them, the Nawaz League has not got the number of seats that the establishment would want. And clearly Imran Khan's independence have won in a much bigger way than the establishment wanted. Nonetheless, this result will not be challenged and questioned by the people of Pakistan. They will accept it because they've had a history of rigged elections in the past, most recently in 2018. Yes, I think uh, at the end of the day, you'll see governments being formed and governments sticking over uh, with the establishment keeping a close watch or oversight over them. And at the end of the day, uh, Imran Khan's party will have to play the role of an opposition in parliament. Uh, but there are going to be all sorts of other issues they don't have a party name right now. They're all independents. We don't know who will stick with Imran Khan and who will not stick with Imran Khan. Part of the strategy of the other two parties and the establishment is now to woo some of these so-called independents away from Imran Khan and get them to join the Noon League or the PPP, uh, which is to say they have three days in which to demonstrate their loyalty either to Imran Khan or to switch and join some party. And if at least 20 or 30 of them do that, then it's smooth sailing for the PVP and the uh, Nawaz League coalition government. Against the background of everything that we've discussed so far, Mr. Sethi, let's focus on the results as announced by the Election Commission. Nawaz Sharif's party is the single biggest, but it cannot form a government on its own. It clearly needs allies. And last night he said he's asking his brother to talk to PPP, to talk to the MQM, to talk to the JUI. Will the PPP, which is the second largest party, agree to ally with Nawaz Sharif? Because I gather before the voting happened, Bilawal Bhutra was expressing a reluctance to do so. Now will there be a change of mind and thinking? You're absolutely right. Um, Bilawal Bhutto was uh, talking about not joining hands with Nawaz Sharif. But I think at the end of the day, Asif Zardari is a very pragmatic person. And if the establishment has willed it to be so, both parties will join hands. The question will be of sharing the spoils of power. And I think that's what the negotiations are going to be about in the next two or three days. So if Possibly that's... longer. How long do you think the negotiations could last? Any time, anything between a week to 10 days or so. And do we have any sense of what sort of portfolio the PPP is looking for? Would they want Bilawal Bhutto to have the foreign ministry once again? Well, Asif Zadari has said he wants Bilawal to be prime minister. Um, so <laughs> nothing less than that. 
He's also expressed a desire to become president of Pakistan again. The presidency will be open for elections in March. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of give and take. Nawaz Sharif has expressed uh, the opinion that he should be prime minister. Uh, Shabazz Sharif is also in the run to be prime minister if Nawaz is not able to or, or is unacceptable. And then there's Mariam Nawaz. So there are three key posts uh, the, P the new league will want for itself. The Asif Zardari may end up with the presidency and maybe a governorship in Sindh, even perhaps in Punjab. And um, because they'll both have to cooperate in Punjab as well to form a government. Uh, so, yes, there's going to be a lot of give and take and bargaining. Given the controversy surrounding the result, and at one point of time, I gather late on Thursday night, Nawaz Sharif himself was said to be trailing. Is there any possibility that either he may hesitate himself to take the prime ministership or he may be asked to avoid doing so? and thus be forced to leave it to his brother Shahbaz Sharif. Is that a possibility? Yes, that's a possibility. In fact, I think uh, Shahbaz Sharif in a uh, recent interview just before the elections uh, is on record as saying that if, he, if they get a majority and are able to form their own government, then Nawaz Sharif will be prime minister. And asked what if that doesn't happen, he said then we'll have to negotiate and we'll have to see uh, where, where it takes us. So this is, the implication there was that if it has to be a difficult coalition government, um, then maybe Shabazz will head the coalition. He's got some experience of doing that, having led it for over a year uh, in the recent past. We've worked with the PPP and with uh, the other parties. It will also give a face saving to Bilawal, who said that he's not ready to accept Nawaz as prime minister. But then, you know, in this give and take, you can have a situation where Zardari is president, Nawaz is Prime Minister, Bilawal is Deputy Prime Minister with powers, and um, Mariam is somebody in the federal government, and Shabazz goes back to the provincial government. So there are combinations over here, uh, and I think there will be some very tough negotiations. But behind the negotiations will be the hand of the establishment, who will be urging them to get on with it and settle issues uh, and, get, and, and, and start making a government. Looking down the road, I imagine the key relationship will be the one between the new Prime Minister and the Army Chief General Asim Munir. Of the two, who will call the shots? Well, on certain issues, the Army Chief will call the shots. And on certain other issues, the Prime Minister will call the shots. The Army has certain areas of interest, including foreign policy, national security policy. And now they're showing an interest in making sure that the economy runs, that the trains run on time, as it were. Uh, so there will be some interventions and some advice, shall we call it, about who should be finance minister and who should be this and who should be that. So I think the cabinet that will be formed will eventually, the list will go to you know where it goes. And uh, there will be some tick marks and some crosses. And it will come back and then there will be some further refinements. So, so I think it will be a, that sort of a situation. You're suggesting almost as if the army will have a veto, not just over portfolio distribution, but even over who makes it to cabinet. Not a veto, but I think they will have some preferences for certain individuals. And certainly they will not like certain other individuals. But generally, this will be confined to, say, one or two here or there. There will be no, literally, you know, it's not going to be a situation where the army is hands on and is running everything. No, it will be arms distance. Just discussion between the ISI and the Prime Minister or the Army Chief and the Prime Minister quietly resolving issues behind the scenes. Now it's believed, and certainly his track record as Prime Minister establishes this as well, that Nawaz Sharif's expertise is handling the economy and Pakistan faces its worst ever economic crisis. Will the army and the army chief in particular be prepared to give Nawaz Sharif a free hand to handle the economy? Or might their advice become a bit of an interference? Uh, in the old days, you could have called it interference. I think uh, politicians are wiser by the year uh, because they end up having to. Do, they end up facing the wrath of the establishment uh, in certain cases when they don't. So I think uh, uh, the army's input will be on who is the finance minister, number one, and how quickly and efficiently you can stay on the IMF program. Hard decisions will have to be taken. 
And if any prime minister thinks he's going to come and dole goodies all around, he's mistaken. That's not going to be allowed. That won't happen. Um, and especially if the finance minister is somebody who's chosen by the army, um, then I think, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, the prime minister will have limited authority and limited power over disbursement of funds and stuff. But at the end of the day, there are two important things. Nawaz Sharif's agenda has always been infrastructural development. So he will continue on that path, number one. Number two, uh, there's an attempt now to reform the tax structure. We are, you know, about 11% or 10 or 10% of GDP. It has to go up to 15, 16% in the next two or three years. There's an attempt to reform the Federal Bureau of Revenue. And the caretakers under the tutelage of the IMF and the uh, Army have already set out the plans. And they've created a super cabinet body uh, already in which the Army chief has a big input to, to oversee some of these things like privatization and uh, debt management and finance management. So I think yeah, the Army and, and, and its people, its experts will be very deeply involved in this. You said a very important thing. You said the finance minister will be chosen by the army. In other words, that critical job of finance minister is one where the army will have to make sure it has its say and its way. I think that could be a problem uh, because Nawaz Sharif would like his own finance minister. And uh, the army will probably may or may not like his choice. Uh, and so therefore they might suggest somebody else. So we have to wait and see how this works out. Because if Shabazz Sharif is in charge, then he will agree to everything the army says. With Nawaz, there may have to be a little bit of a give and take. What about critical foreign relationships like the relationship with America, with India, with critical Gulf countries, particularly Saudi Arabia and the UAE? Will the army wield the upper hand here? I think there's going to be no difference of opinion between what the army wants and what Nawaz Sharif stands for. Nawaz Sharif has always had good relations with all, all presidents and prime ministers in the global world. The issue has always been India. And the interesting thing is that in Imra, Nawaz has not given up his peace with India uh, policy. Even yesterday when he, after the, when he came and addressed his party workers, and this is not clear whether he was going to be prime minister or not, he talked about the fact that he wanted to have peace in the neighborhood. And that was a direct reference, if anything, to India. Uh, the army has its own way of looking at India. Even when they want peace in the region, they want it tactically in a particular way, which is where the problems arose in the past. Uh, so I think there will have to be some uh, backpack, backtracking by Nawaz uh, on some of these issues. I don't think there will be any issues until the Indian elections take place. And after the Indian elections, what sort of attitude uh, India's prime minister has towards Pakistan, whether he's at all interested in normalization or not. And then we'll see how it works out. But I think the position in the army is very clear. We've got to work out our economics. We've got to stop fighting in the neighborhood. And if we can stitch up whatever we can, we should. So what is General Munir's personal position on India? Is he, as it's sometimes said, a hardliner? Or is he receptive, as General Bajwa was said to be, to a better relationship with New Delhi? I think there are marginal differences. Um, the new army chief will want uh, Nawaz to negotiate hard, not to give, give, give up anything without a quid pro quo. So there will be some of these issues. But if Nawaz is able to hand some of these negotiations to people selected by the army, then he can make headway. So I think uh, they'll work out something or the other. Now, Kashmir and Terra are the two sticking points in the relationship. Kashmir from the Pakistan point of view, Terra from the Indian point of view. But is it possible for the two governments, and I mean actually your government in the first instance, to improve relationships in terms of trade? Because trade has ground to a complete standstill. Can that be a starting point? And secondly, can they once again restore their high commissioners to each other's capital? Could that be a second starting point? I think once the Indian elections take place, there will be some approaches made uh, to see what, how far or what beginnings can be made. And I think these are these low-hanging fruits, people-to-people -people contacts, visa, better visa facilities, comings and goings, and um, trade. I think that will be definitely on Pakistan's agenda. Uh, the question is problematic is that um, 
uh, we've so far tied it to a reversal of what has happened in your part of Kashmir. And since the real politic is that there's no likelihood of that status quo changing now, uh, there will have to be some flexibility on Pakistan's side. How they will manage to do that remains to be seen. Let's briefly talk about the Punjab province. Punjab, in a very real sense, determines what happens in the rest of the country. And I noticed from the results that although Nawaz Sharif in Punjab has more seats than the independents who are supporting Imran Khan together, nonetheless, he's short of a majority. And I believe even with PPP support, he will still be short of a majority. So will he be able to cobble together a PMLN-led government in Punjab? Uh, yes, he will be able to do so. Simple reason that we have to take into our calculation the reserved seats, the reserved seats for minorities and women. So these are in proportion to the actual number of seats you win. And they're distributed as per party position. Now, the PTI is not a party. So unless the PTI can find a way of establishing itself as a party and therefore making claim on the reserved number of seats that it gets by the formula, those reserved seats will go to PPP and to Nawaz, mostly to the Noon League. And in that case, uh, another 30, 40, 50 reserved seats, they can uh, romp home. So, um, so I don't think they will have a problem uh, uh, putting a PMLN-led government in Punjab. Am I right in saying that when it comes to Khyber Pokhthunkhwa and Sindh, the Imran Khan independents have swept effectively Hebat Bakhtulwa and PPP has effectively swept Sindh. Those two will be in a position to form a government. Yes, I think there's no way they can stop a PTI government being formed in, in, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. And obviously, there will be a PPP government in Sindh. Uh, Punjab is going to be the problem. I think in Balochistan, they will find a solution. Uh, and the solution probably will be a, a, a government led by the PPP rather than the PMLN, with the, perhaps PMLN playing a junior partner as uh, in, in the federal government. Uh, so, yes, I think uh, Zardari Saab will have Balochistan and Sindh. Nawaz Sharif will have the federal government and Punjab. KP will have, uh, PTI will have KP. Uh, I think that's how the cookie will crumble in the end. Let me end by talking briefly about Asif Zardari. He's made it clear that he would like to be president when the presidential election happens in March. If Nawaz Sharif is prime minister, will he be happy to have Asif Zardari as president? Or could there be a problem between the two of them? Well, I mean, Asif Zardari was president of Pakistan from 2008 till 2013. Um, did a fairly good job. Uh, no control, no major controversies, cooperated with the military, except there was a hiccup um, over the uh, Osama bin Laden affair when there was a suspicion that perhaps um, he was critical of the army's handling of the situation. Uh, but uh, beyond that, he hasn't had any problems. He was a good, solid president. And I don't think, uh, and since the president is ceremonial by and large, he doesn't really have any powers. I don't think Nawaz will have any issue. Uh, getting uh, giving the presidency to Asif Zardari. Khatam Sethi, thank you very much for this interview and thank you for making time for me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.